Welcome, everybody. Um, good evening from wherever you are. I'm Brian Schiff. I'm the director of the George and Irina Schaefer Center for the Study of Genocide, Human Rights, and Conflict Prevention at the American University of Paris. And on behalf of the center and the American University of Paris, I'd like to welcome you tonight to tonight's lecture by Lerna Ekmekliogo. For those of you who don't know the center, uh, we're involved in numerous projects, some internal to AUP, such as curricular and pedagogical development, support for faculty and student research, and some external facing uh, projects such as scholarly convocation. Tonight's lecture is part of the center's long-term initiative to focus on the Armenian genocide. One of the components of this initiative is or was to convene an international conference on cutting edge research on the history and memory of the Armenian genocide. The conference we planned, Understanding Genocide, Genocides, the Genocide of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, was unfortunately postponed due to COVID-19. However, this work is too important to delay in, a, in an effort to keep the momentum we began organizing online lectures. As the pandemic continues, the lectures on the Armenian genocide seem to have evolved into a series. Tonight's lecture, Use Consoling Words for Our Butchered Nation, Armenian Feminists Post-Genocide Expectations of Their Turkish Counterparts, is given by Lerna Ekmekliogu. Lerna is Macmillan Stewart Associate Professor of History at the Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's also affiliated with the Women and Gender Studies Program. Together with Melissa Bilal, she is the co-editor of the 2006 book in Turkish titled A Cry for Justice, Five Armenian Feminist Writers from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic, 1862 to 1933. Her first monograph, Recovering Armenia, The Limits of Belonging in Post-Genocide Turkey, came out from Stanford University Press in 2016. Currently, she's collaborating with Melissa Bilal on feminism in Armenia, Armenian, an interpretive anthology and digital archive, which focuses on the life and works of 12 pioneering women intellectuals from the 1860s to the 1960s. Unfortunately, our scheduled discussant, Elise Semerjan, is unable to be with us tonight. And Ronald Suni has graciously agreed to lead the discussion of Lerna's paper. Ronald Suni is William Sewell Jr. Distinguished University Professor of History at the University of Michigan an Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago. Uh, SUNY was the first holder of the Alex Manoogian Chair in Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan, where he founded and directed the Armenian Studies Program. Dr. SUNY is author of numerous monographs on Armenian history, Slavic studies, and Soviet and post-Soviet history and politics. Among his books is They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, The History of the Armenian Genocide by Princeton University Press in 2015. And he's currently working on a book on the recent upsurge of exclusion, exclusion, exclusivist nationalisms and authoritarianism populisms, forging the nation, the making and faking of nationalisms. I'm going to let Lerna um, take the floor, but before I do that, um, if I could ask everybody to please put your questions into the question and answer um, button on Zoom. We are in the webinar mode, um, and uh, that means that you will that only the participants will be visible um, on video, and questions will be asked by myself, uh, Constance, and principally by Ron Suni. 
So welcome, Lerna. Thank you for, for your lecture tonight. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I would like to first of all thank the um, Georgian Irina Schaefer Center for the study of genocide, human rights, and conflict prevention uh, for hosting me today, and uh, Brian and Constance and Antonina for the logistics and um, making it all put together and ready for today. Uh, I'm very sorry that Elise Semerjan couldn't be with us today because she uh, should be a very good fit, I think, to open up a conversation about the topics that I'm going to bring up today. Uh, but the second best person is here with us, Ron uh, Suni. I'm very grateful that like a few hours ago, we let him know that this is happening and he graciously accepted. This is, this is big. I am, uh, I'm also a previous, as I think you mentioned, I don't remember, but I have uh, had the great fortune of being a postdoctoral fellow at his institution in the Armenian Studies program as a Manugian fellow, uh, thanks to which I have to say, I would like to really publicly acknowledge that I got the, the, the job that I have now, the MIT job, which I greatly appreciate. I wouldn't have otherwise, I honestly be here uh, if it wasn't for the general support of that program with Liberidian and Fatma Megegecek and Bardakcian uh, fully supporting me. Okay, so I'm going to start my talk, but as I have already informed the organizers, it is a little bit longer than usual, usual for me at least. I know in the past you have had longer talks in under this umbrella and with Ron, I think at some point. Um, we will see how it goes. If I feel like it's just too much and I just cannot hold everyone's attention, even though I will not be feeling it, I'll just like intuitively sense it, I guess. I'll, I'll just skip. If not, I'll read. Um, in hopes that it will be stimulating enough for you all to continue following this journey with me. I would like to start with by taking you to the last days of 1918. The war has just ended. It's almost New Year's Eve. A 44-year-old Armenian writer named Zaruhi Kalemkerian picked up the pen to compose an open letter addressed to Halide Edip Adivar, the famous Turkish feminist educator and novelist who had written an article two months previously in which she talked about the wartime suffering of Armenians. Zaruhi Kalimkerian praised Halide Edip uh, reminding her that she is a woman and a writer and that she has capacity for compassion and that she had proven it, Zaruhi reminded her, quote, in the first days after the armistice by using consoling words about the butchered Armenian nation. What did Zaruhi mean by consoling words, amokich lezo? Why did she think that Halide Edeb was or should be capable of comforting Armenians with her pen. What was Halide's response? In today's talk, I'll discuss the question of feminist positionalities vis-a-vis -vis state violence and historical injustice. I'll focus on the case of Armenian and Turkish women in the aftermath of the 1909 Adana massacres and the 1915 Armenian genocide. So I need to correct the record that the title says post-genocide, but I, as I dig in further into the post-genocide, I recognize that for, for sheer reasons of clarity and analytical vigor, I had to go back to Adana massacres. So I will have, I will devote like almost 40% of the talk to the immediate aftermath of the Adana events of 1909. So we have two historical moments, post-1909 and post-1915-18. I am interested in the possibilities and impossibilities of feminist solidarity, especially between ethno-religious communities separated by imperial hierarchies and or women divided between perpetrator and victim groups. I have two arguments. First, that for the victim group, expression of sympathy mattered. In reference to sympathy, Armenians used a plethora of words, both in Armenian and in Turkish, that captured the meaning of the Greek origin of the word sim sympathy, sim together, pathos, passion, emotion, that meaning fellow feeling or community of feeling. Since sentiments have historically been associated with femininity and emotional expression, 
or rather vulnerability, and therefore more permissible for femininity, women intellectuals put even more emphasis to express and hear words of affinity of feelings, and often as mothers. Words such as hamagrutyun, mkhitarang, ispopang, kututyun, dvaydang, amokel in Armenian, and hemhal olmak, hemdert olmak, teselli, teselliyamiz, elemimize iştirak, hissi muhabbet, among others, gestured, gestured towards cause suffering, which included in itself recognition of the pain and an in implicit wish to undo it. The second argument, the kinds of meanings feminists attach to mass violence, as well as the immensity of the loss they experienced, ultimately determined their understanding of justice and reparation. For Armenians, the genocide meant the elimination of their life world. It was an existential loss. Extermination meant termination, termination of almost all that was before. For Turkish feminists, on the other hand, as immense and as re regrettable as it possibly was, the wartime Armenian massacres represented yet another round of unfortunate episode of imperial history, one that they could see past. Halide Edip Adavar will play a prominent role in today's talk, as she was one of the most vocal and publicly outspoken intellectuals of the time, let alone being the most prominent woman of her time. To this day, she is an iconic figure in Turkey. Hundreds of books, articles, masters, and PhD theses have been written about her, as well as multiple biographies, which I gratefully used for this presentation. Only recently, this vast scholarship has begun to pay attention to her thinking about, thinking about an involvement in the Armenian genocide, be it in the vast literature she produced, or in her life story. And some names that I would like to mention here is Murat Belge, İpek Çalışlar, Hülya Adak, Hazal Halavut, Sel and uh, these are more literature people, and Selim Deringil and Hilmar Kaiser, the more, uh, historians. I mean, um, yeah, there is more people. Yet, Armenia, but I mean, despite this vastness of the literature, Armenian language sources have been sorely missing from this story that we have been told about Halide Edip. This is the gap that I begin to fill here, hoping to contribute also to the ongoing discussions about her legacy. With regards to Armenian feminists, I will mainly focus on Zaru Kalem Keryan. Um, she's, in, she's nearly forgotten in the annals of Armenian history, despite her enormous archive housed in Yerevan in the Yerishe Charens Museum of Literature and Arts. So she lived for 97 years and she started writing at the age of 16. And whatever she wrote, pretty much she saved, and they are in that archive, which has not been used before. And so all the pictures that I use in today's presentation in the PowerPoint slides uh, come from that archive. I'll also incorporate other Armenian women as appropriate as a way of writing all these voices back into the relevant histories. I should note that what I am presenting today comes from the book and digital humanities project called uh, Feminism in Armenian, an interpretive anthology that I'm co-writing with Dr. Melissa Bilal of UCLA. So many ideas presented in this talk were developed in conversation with Dr. Bilal. So now I'll start sharing my screen and we will go. So you're only seeing my screen, my PowerPoint, right? Let's look at Zaruhi Kalemkerian's early life. As you can see, she was born as Seferian into a well-to-do family in 1874 in Kadıköy, Modabudno. She was raised by a Greek nanny and received her first schooling at a Greek neighbor's daycare. At the Aramian school, in Kadıköy, where she went for her secondary school, secondary education, her uh, Armenian language and literature teacher, Hagop Kurken, launched Zaruhi's literary career. Her first poem was published when she was 16, followed by her two poetry volumes in 1893 and 94. 
Even though her family supported girls' education, under the frightening influence of public opinion, they discouraged Zarahi from using her real name and forbid her from expressing romantic love in her writing. She chose the pen name Yevderbe, uh, the music of lyric poetry in Greek mythology. And instead of writing about the love of her life, Mihran, she wrote about the moon, the sea, and the flower, flowers. Despite her family's objection, however, she managed to marry their neighbor Mihran Kalemkelyan. Their only child, Alice, was born the next year. In 1898, when she was in her mid-twenties, Zari started a regular column in the daily Puzantion under the title Ganans Pajin, Women's Section. And this is a very early case of uh, women's section in the newspapers in Constantinople. In the coming years, she penned more than 100 opinion pieces on the role of women in society, covering issues from local politics to Italian feminism, from the Dreyfus affair to Tbilisi Armenian women's religious activities. Sometimes she left the column to her friend, confident and neighbor, Anais. I don't know if you can see the cursor. Probably, yes. Anais, Gefme uh, Avedisian, uh, another budding intellectual and activist, her, friend, uh, her neighbor also. Zari Kalimkerian was one of the early voices in the genealogy of Armenian feminism, but she was by no means the first one. As Melissa and I analyzed in her in our uh, forthcoming volume, the movement starts quite early among Armenians. With the publication of Yelbis Geseratsian's um, Women's Journal, Guitar, in 1862, and many others follow suit. So these 10 women are the 10 other women that we study in addition to the previously mentioned two in our upcoming book. Most Armenians, including the women we study, welcomed the 1908 revolution, Young Turk Revolution, Constitutional Revolution with sincere celebration. Feminists of all Ottoman millets felt invigorated by the new climate of post-despotic freedom. New women's organizations and journals blossomed. Ottomanism, that is the brotherhood or sisterhood of all the ethnic and religious groups making up the Ottoman Empire was the leading ideology of a significant portion of the society. For the first time, a Turkish and Armenian Women's Association was formed in Istanbul and they fundraised together for the refugees of the Hamidian regime who were now able to return from exile. This new atmosphere of optimism and shared destiny, however, was abruptly cut short by the 1909 Cilician uh, massacres, during which Ottoman Muslims massacred about 15 to 20,000 Armenians in contemporary southern Turkey, around Adana. It was shocking that a version of the 1890s Hamidian massacres repeated themselves on the heels of a constitutional revolution that claimed to endorse the equality and brotherhood of all Ottomans. The Adana massacres changed the direct direction of Armenian feminism forever. Its progress was inhibited. It had to direct its energies to recovery. Arshagui Teotik and Zabeli Eseyan went to the rich region, wrote down their observations and informed the public about what was happening there. Armenian women helped collect orphans, uh, brought some girls from the region to Istanbul so that they are not kidnapped there. Uh, and they had this, um, this recovery of the damage inflicted by the Ottoman state became there from then on, maybe Hamidian massacres, but at the time they weren't able to explicitly talk about it or ex legitimately help the uh, survivors. After this point, it became an inexplicable component of Armenian feminists effort, this relationship between Armenian feminism and the Turkish state and violence. They would have killed, so to speak, to have the fellowship of their Muslim sisters. At least one of them rose to the occasion, Halide Edip. She penned an article in 1909 titled, Those Who Died and Those Who Killed. It was nothing short of an apology. Before I turn to this text, however, let me quickly review Edip's life until that moment. She was born in 1884. She spent her childhood and youth in Üsküdar and Ijadiye, towns heavily populated by Ottoman Christians, and as it happens, right next to Kalem Kelyan's neighborhood. She came also from a well-to-do family, her father working in Abdul Hamid's court. Like Zaruhi, Halide attended a Greek uh, woman's 
daycare and learned street Greek as well as some Armenian. In 1901, she graduated from the Upper School of the American College for Girls in Constantinople with distinction. She is the first woman to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree from the college, which overwhelmingly catered to non-Muslims. Halide would later write that if it wasn't for an eld older Armenian girl showing her ablashevkati, sisterly compassion, she would have dropped out of college. Established by American missionary women and under the directorship of progressive American women led by an all-female board, the college promoted a feminist and internationalist ethos as well as religious tolerance. And it would play an important role in Halide's worldview for a long time. Her proclivity for intellectual in, uh, endeavors was evident quite early. She published translations from English when she was 14. She also started penning short stories in the Ottoman Turkish Women's Journal, Hanımlara Mahsus Gazete, in her late teenage years. But it was the 1908 Young Turk Revolution that would jumpstart her career as a publicist, as a public intellectual, as well as an educator. She saw the Hamidian uh, regime as a tyranny and explicitly wrote about it and euphorically welcomed this revolt, the revolution, assured that the young Turks would remedy the blood wrongs of the past. In her weekly columns, she propagated modern ideas about girls' education and their right to partake in public life. As a staunch Ottomanist, she subscribed to the idea that all constituent ethno-religious groups living under Ottoman rule were one Ottoman nation, much like the American nation. She had this America ideal for good and for bad, if, as you will see. This Ottomanist ideal, which was prevalent in the liberal Turkish intelligentsia, did not last for a long time. Its first blow came with the March 1909 counter-revolution, organized by the disgruntled members of the Ottoman military and staged in the name of Islam. Halide received threats because of her progressive ideas. And in the violent first days of the counter-revolution, she had to escape Constantinople. Her husband, the renowned mathematician of the time, uh, her husband of the time, mathematician and professor Salih Zeki, entrusted her with a letter of reference addressed to an Armenian professor in Alexandria so that he could take care of her. So she left for uh, overnight, almost she left for Egypt. She fled. A group of Armenians welcomed her, welcomed her in the port in Alexandria and settled her in a nearby hotel where she stayed for weeks. It was in her hotel room that she heard the terrible news of the April 1909 massacres against Armenians. She penned a strongly worded essay in response, which is worth a closer look. So this is the first text that I'll be going into detail. Ölenlerle öldürenler. Sorry, ölenlerle öldürülenler. It is dedicated, it was this whole piece, those who died and those who killed, it was dedicated to, quote, my fellow Armenian citizens, the last sufferers and the most abundant victims of the Hamidian nightmare. From early on, therefore, Halide's understanding of the perpetrator is clear here, the Hamidian regime. But despite what might look like shifting the blame to the previous rulers, she is willing to acknowledge the ethno-religious line that divided perpetrators and victims. After noting that her pride for the constitutional revolution is dying down, as she observes in her mind's eye, the Armenians blackened and effaced country, I'm quoting from her, their bloody bodies, their homeless children, and their mothers whose children were ripped away from their bosoms, she arrives to the heart of this essay. I quote, with the despair and shame of belonging to the group who killed, my soul is aching for you with motherly grief. It's groaning for you with motherly suffering and destitution. She proudly declares that there are also many Turks who would never engage in, engage in or approve of such bloodshed as they respect the sacredness of human life. 
These people include the fallen heroes of the revolution, those who successfully fought against the counter-revolution but fell for liberty and left behind suffering mothers and destitute orphans. They too are Turks, she said. And it is in their name that Halide says she came to write this essay. It is on behalf of this noble element that she humbly begs forgiveness from Armenians. I quote from her, humbly beg forgiveness from Armenians for their unprecedented calamity. In her conclusion, the addressee of the essay changes, calling out the new Ottoman nation. So she, she's now addressing to the new nation, post-revolution nation, the one that produced victorious generals like Niazi and Meren Salatin. She asks the young Turks to avenge the blood of Armenians, much like how they managed to suppress the counter-revolution. She ends the piece by warning that if those who, quote, blemish the name of the Turks in perpetrating the massacres are not punished, punished, an everlasting stain of ignorance will stay with the young Turks. Halid Edip was not the only Turkish intellectual to express disdain for the massacres, but her voice struck a different chord than the others. Was it because she was the only prominent woman to do so? Her gendered language might have added to her visibility, but I rather think that it is the clarity of her tone about who did what and how to remedy it that distinguished this essay from others. And it was all in the name, those who died and those who killed. Her words resonated with Armenians. Their responses, I believe, serve as a microcosm of what Armenians in general have always expected from the majority in the face of state violence. So a brief uh, discussion is therefore due before I analyze the women to women responses. Just a second. Yeah. So at least two are mean, actually all of them, but I'm focusing here on the two of them who translated. These are Armenian dailies who translated uh, Halide's uh, words, both of them in full and with some uh, editorial notes at the end. Byzantion and Jamanak, note, both of their notes, started with expressing how overwhelmed Armenians were with such a touching appeal, respecting the memory of the victims. So Tahalde becomes a hero for them. Byzantion admitted that, quote, this unexampled sympathy for our Armenian brothers will serve as a partial consolation. It was partial because it had to be followed by action. The note continued. We hope that in conformity with the noble woman author's behest, every effort will be made to provide solace to those who lost their loved ones during those terrible massacres, suffering material ruin as well. Jamanak, which titled the translation, Revenge from those who killed the Armenians, read, Quote, we hope that so sincere, so heartfelt an appeal will find an echo among, among the young Turks whose vocation it is to or reorganize the country. The criminals will find their pun just punishment in that recognition, reorganization, and this beastly act of mass savagery will be the last in Ottoman history. In sum, recognize it, feel remorse, Repair the wrong, do not repeat. I recognize that this formula for restorative justice from the perspective of the wronged group sounds uncannily familiar to our contemporary ears. In the coming weeks, at least two Armenian women, Sirpui Markaryan and Baizar Torkomyan, wrote response essays to Halide Edip and published them in Turkish papers. One of them wrote in Turkish, the other one wrote in Armenian and got, uh, had it translated to, to Turkish. What made the women's discourses different than the men's? Was there, was there a difference? To a certain degree, yes. Since women have historically been identified with sentiments, tenderness, and affection, they could afford to infuse their narratives with more feelings. This was especially the case since their addressee was also a woman and a woman who has been writing on women's issues. Actually, if Ölenler ve Öldürlenler hadn't been written by a woman, 
Armenian women would likely not have written responses. They took it upon themselves precisely because Sirpui and Baizar saw themselves as Edip's interlocutors. By taking it upon herself to apologize to the Armenians and doing so as a progressive Turkish mother, Halil Edip moved the discourse from one of the solely male business of politics to a female platform where emotion and morality could be mixed in. In sum, she enabled an opening for Armenian women. Both Sirpu and Baizar opened their response essays by telling how her words made them feel. They were not able to hold back their tears. They cried and cried and everyone reading the essay cried with them. Both made a point of the woman to woman nature of their communication. While Sirpu thanked Halide in the name of all Armenian women, Baizar was assured that Halide articulated, quote, the feelings of all our conscientious Muslim sisters. Torkomian noted, humans are weird. They are pleased by witnessing the public declaration of sincere sentiments, even from those whose position they don't question. Even though I knew that you shared our anguish, she continued, I still felt a great ease of heart reading your comforting article. She wanted Halide to write more such articles because, quote, the hearts clouded by doubt, doubt about Turkish intentions post-constitutional revolution, would calm down by hearing Halide's words that, quote, we are the children of the same homeland and therefore we grieve for each other's sorrow and celebrate each other's happiness. In other words, for her, commiseration was a defining feature of citizenship. Markarian similarly noted that people feel a certain sense of closeness and gratitude to those who share their pain, pain and console them during dark and sad days. Halide's article, therefore, she went, being, quote, being a sincere expression of your feelings, it gave us consolation and hope. She then turned the lens to her sex, underlying how important a role women, especially educated women like Halide, play in the fate of their nations. She asked Turkish mothers through Halide, to instill the idea of justice and fraternity in their children, starting from the cradle. They had to do that, Markarian added, so that the Ottoman nation won't endure forever. It is because, she went on, it's a historical fact that no nation can last forever without justice, and no one can deny it. Break. It is 25 minutes. I won't have to cut. I just arrived the half, first uh, half of, in, in the first half. Okay, so the Adana part is over. We are moving to the 1918 moment. Move forward in time, go back to the open letter that I opened the talk with. Oh, sorry, I didn't change the slide. These are the two uh, Armenian women's pieces in Turkish newspapers, Tanin and Yeni Gazete. Okay, so Zari Kalimkerian here, of course, with a book in when she's 38, still in Istanbul, published the this open letter. I also have the handwritten version of it in because it is saved in the uh, archive in Yerevan, it was published in Norgyang, and then it was also published, uh, translated to French and published in the French newspaper in Constantinople, uh, Renaissance. So this piece opens unexpectedly by recalling Halide Edip's essay that she wrote, Ölenler Öldürlenler, after, after Adana, uh, which, uh, which Zaruhi defines as one that ch chanted the pain of Armenian women and girls. Focuses on the fact that, I mean, actually she kind of makes it up that Halide made a point of women and girls' pain. Her opening gambit in this open letter continued with a reference to Edip's October 1918 essay, 
which I'll be discussing extensively shortly. Okay, this Edip essay is titled "In the Face of Wilson's Principles," written uh, only two months prior. So Zarhi talked about Halide's essay in the following words: "Madam." With a writer's noble soul, you spoke about the Armenian nation in the first days of peace. From the first day of peace, because the Talat Pasha government resigned on October 6, and Halide wrote the piece on October 22. And it was very obvious that uh, the withdrawal of the Ottomans were, uh, it was, was upon them. Okay. With the writer's novel soul, you spoke about the Armenian nation in the first days of peace. From the very first day you sensed that your pen was free, you dipped it in the Armenian's pain, wept together with my suffering grace, and gave us reason to believe in those first days of dawn that you were one of the rare exceptions to a nation's accursed pack. We translated your laments into our language in order to show Armenian women that it was possible to find among Muslim women as well, a measure of compassion for Armenians and affliction over their sufferings. So we see a similar quest here for commiseration, for weeping together, for the co-inhabitants of the city to co-lament. There's also a new desire to find a Turk, a woman at that, to be counted as an exception. As I've previously shown in my work on Armenians in post-genocide Istanbul, this search for exceptions for good Turks was part and parcel of an overall survival strategy that harvested hope out of total destruction. It is shared by many groups victimized by discrimination and studied most frequently in the case of Jews who remained in Nazi Germany. Another Armenian woman, Kohar Mazlumyan, wrote an essay in 1920 in the Armenian feminist journal Haigin titled, the article titled, What Did the Turkish Woman Do During the War? She mentioned how she wished some Turkish women had opposed to the policies of the government during the war, how she wished they had tried to help Armenians in any way possible. Instead, instead they kept silent, even though they could have exercised some power over their husbands. She too was looking for righteous Turkish women. In that context, she gave only one name, Halide Edip Hanım, as someone who did speak up originally, referring to this article, October 1918, but quote, then changed color. Going back to our original writer, Zarhi Kalem Keryan, it's noteworthy that unlike Sirpuy and Bayzar in 1909, Zarhi did not write the essay to thank Halide, but to dare her, to dare her to help Armenians recover what was lost, in this case, to collect their orphans from Muslim homes. Zari also asked why she changed her mind so quickly, referring to, referring to Halide's increasingly nationalist tone. Halide's essay, In the Face of Wilson's Principles, Wilson's Şartları Karşısında, is worth a closer look. First, we need to underline that it didn't address Armenians nor was it dedicated to them. It was rather an internal conversation among Turks written haphazardly, I would say, by a concerned intellectual who wanted to warn the government about some impending dangers. It's like eight days before the signing of the Armistice. Halide Edip did not use any gendered language nor any vocabulary connoting feelings except for one sentence at the very end, where she noted that she writes this essay in the name of Turkish peasants uh, who helped Armenians during the war, and in the name of Turkish intellectuals who shared the sorrow, sorrow of Armenian intellectuals and wept with them. But this one reference to compassion was a minor, minor point in this text, which was, as the title indicates, written to support the peace terms that Woodrow Wilson offered for the post-war world order. Halide hailed Wilson's principles as the second declaration of the rights of men and of the citizen of 1789. She equated the rights that the French Revolution granted to individuals to the rights that Wilson's principles granted to nations. 
Wilson's respect to the desire for national independence for every group. And this is why Halliday admired Wilson, seeing in him effectively a guarantor of post-defeat Turkish independence. This is basically her Wilsonian moment, and she's not alone here. She was concerned, however, that in this divine quote, in this divine declaration, we the Turks are the ones who are pointed to as those whose lands and rights need to be restricted because of the policies of oppression and annihilation, zulum ve imha, we pursued against our own citizens who belong to a different religion. In other words, what the Turkish state did to Armenians during the war posed an obstacle in the transition from defeat to continued national liberty. The author did not deny the factuality of what the West taught Tur Turks did to their Armenians. She wrote, during our last days of strength, as if it were a service to the Turkish constituents, we deported the Christians, especially Armenians, by using medieval procedures and we tried to annihilate them. Continues. In the eyes of the civilized world, which cares so much about freedom of conscience, we are a nation, we look like a nation that killed an innocent people and use psychological pressure to make them change their religion. She noted that American, English, and even German humanitarians recorded it all and quote, tomorrow they will impeach us with this ugly and dirty stain, end of quote. The main problem therefore, if not the main, but the major problem here was the undeniability of the genocide as we call it today. Neither Kalem Keryan nor the many Armenian newspapers who happily translated and published parts of her has essay paid attention to Edip's politically instrumentalist logic. Not because they were naive, but because they were strategic. They did not focus on who she blamed for the Armenian massacres because it conflicted with the Armenians' general understanding of um, general understanding that the whole of the Turkish nation was the culprit and therefore had to be punished accordingly. Halide, on the other hand, like many of her peers, thought that the Turkish nation was in fact innocent. A few men and Germany were the culprits. She wrote, one day out of love of homeland and idealism, a few primitive and barbaric heads conceived of the plan of the Armenian deportations. She added that Germany did not just turn a blind eye to this plan, but also encouraged them. Quote, these men's way of thinking was sincere, but savage. And it turned into an unprecedented murder and catastrophe at the hands of a few more murderers and thieves, she continues. These governors, state functionaries and delegates then escaped, leaving the burden of this unprecedented murder and theft on the innocent shoulders of the Turkish nation. Halide was not the only one writing openly about the Armenian catastrophe at this unique historical moment, especially after the fall of the Talat Pasha government and before the consolidation of the Turkish Kemalist movement, Ottoman intellectuals and politicians of Greek, Turkish, Arab uh, backgrounds openly discussed the Armenian massacres and deportations as part and parcel of their assessment of the political situation after the withdrawal of the Ottomans from the war. As Vahakan Dadaryan analyzed in his book, Judgment at Istanbul, co-authored with Taner Akçam, a general malaise and pervasive sense of guilt surrounded Turkish intellectuals and politicians at this time. They were uncertain about the specific post-war reckoning that would be imposed on them by the allies, especially in light of the global awareness of and sympathy for this uh, this uh, what became like an iconic uh, way of referring to them, the martyred Armenia. They basically wanted to mitigate the severity of the impending peace terms. It was beyond the, their imagination at this stage that they would be able to get away with the genocide. The Ottoman parliament too openly discussed such issues and military tribunals were established. In general, the logic of the overwhelming majority of the Turkish intellectuals and politicians was that the Turkish nation could
could not be held responsible for the wartime crimes of a political party and the government it controlled. In this essay, this uh, Halide Edip, in order to demonstrate the changes in the Turkish government's behavior towards Armenians and convince a worldwide public of the goodwill of the post-war Turkish nation, and as a concerned intellectual, she recommended two motions to the government. First, return surviving Armenians to their homes. Second, allow them uh, to go back, allow, the, uh, what, allow them to go back to their original religion. By the time of her writing, the government had already started allowing some Armenians to return from, deport, from exile, but she emphasized that it looked like as if the Turks were only doing these things under pressure from the British and that they were, they were not sincere in their remorse. To convince the victorious powers that the post-war government was not taking half measures, this is her, she says half measures, we need to convince them, Hadi they recommended the formation of a commission to supervise the Armenians' return and the inclusion in this commission of Armenians, Americans, and the few Turks who had stood up for the Armenians during the war in Rochester. With regards to the punishment of the real perpetrators, however, she suggested that the military tribunals be postponed to a later time once all the frenzy calmed down. Why did Halide, who so wanted to cleanse the name of the innocent Turkish nation, stop short of asking for the immediate establishment of the courts so that justice could be served? Interestingly, she already imagined that her whole nation was being tried in the court of the global public opinion. She wrote that, quote, once the nation is acquitted in front of the civilized world, end of quote, she would talk about how Armenians also killed Turks out of vengeance. Of course, this part too did not make it into the Armenian translations of Halide's text. Was there a different source of anxiety for Halide Edip in asking for the postponement of the wartime tribunals? Did she think of herself as implicated in the crime? There is reason to believe so. During the Great War, Halide Edip served as the superintendent of Ottoman Turkish schools in Greater Syria. Ottoman 4th Army Commander Ahmed Cemal Pasha opened these modern schools in order to fight French and other foreign influence among Ottoman Arabs. In time, this goal merged with Jemal Pasha's orphan relief efforts. Armenian, Kurdish, and Turkish orphans, and also Assyrian orphans who were deported or somehow found their way to Aleppo, Damascus, Beirut, or other parts of Ottoman Syria, were sheltered in Jemal Pasha's orphanages. For Armenian children, to receive this service from their government, they had to be converted to Islam. Halide Edip was the supervisor of one such orphanage school, Aintura in Beirut, which housed hundreds of Armenian children at some point close to 1500. Before and during Halide Edip's tenure at this place, children were given Muslim names, forbidden from speaking Armenian, and forcibly taught the Turkish language and practices of Islam. Some boys were circumcised. They were also subjected to bastinado, though it is not certain if its use was stopped after Halide Edip's arrival. A mass grave containing the remains of 300 children was found in the school's promise, premises in 2011, where the College of St. Joseph's sits today. Memoirs of inmate children, such as Karnik Panyan's Goodbye Antura, recently translated to English, testify to the horrible conditions. Given the time constraints, I will not go into the details of Edip's role in this historical episode, but we can discuss it in the Q&A. What is important for the purposes of this presentation is the following. She knew that what she and Jamal Pasha was doing in Antura was wrong and that it could be used against them had the information leak out, which Halide knew. What we do know is that Halide soon became one of the most ardent propagandists of the Turkish national resistance movement with all its anti-Greek and anti-Armenian emphasis. 
Her activism, which had started after the occupation of Constantinople by the British, French, and the Italians, peaked after the Greek occupation of Syria, uh, Smyrna. In the protests organized in Istanbul, she gave these famous public speeches in front of thousands, tens of thousands of Ottoman Muslims who were alarmed about the imminent partitioning of what they considered to be their land. For Halide, Greek occupation represented the betrayal of the Wilsonian principle, whose 12th point emphasized that Turkish portions of the present Ottoman Empire should be assured a secure sovereignty. Similarly, she was furious that Armenians worked for, the, for cessation from the Ottoman Union and that they wanted self-governance in eastern parts of Anatolia, claiming it as their historical homeland. Armenians also referred to the 12th article of the Wilson's principles, which continued, quote, but the other nationalities which are now under Turkish rule should be assured of having an undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous development. For Halide, Ottoman Arabs deserved self-governance and autonomy as they were the majority in Syria, as well as because of bad governance, but Armenians and Greeks didn't. In fact, she had to clarify her position vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, let me see, Arabs, as she was challenged by some Ottoman intellectuals who accused her of being an accomplice to Jamal Pasha's violent uh, policies against the Arabs during the war. Because if obviously for the Arabs, Jamal Pasha's uh, violent policies uh, had way more, it had, had, was remembered at this time in Constantinople actually quite often. So she, she was not many uh, intellectuals, Ottoman intellectuals with Arab Ottoman intellectuals saw her as an accomplice implicated in Jamal Pasha's efforts. Ahmed Hashim, a well-known Turkish uh, intellectual at the time and a poet to the state, he's a well-known figure, for instance, wrote an expose of some sort after Halide's October 22 article about Wilson. Instead of refusing to participate to Jamal Pasha's crime, he wrote, Halide Edip enjoyed the status and beautiful scenery in Syria. Ahmed Hashim mostly means the, the policies against the Arabs, but also adding Armenians there to, in the article, adding that Ahmed Hashim, during her trip to Syria, Halide Edip, so by coincidence, Ahmed Hashim sees, he was in Konya at the time, sees her, uh, sees Halide Edip and her retinue of teachers, about 50 people going to Ottoman Syria in late 1916. She, she sees them and this is how she talks about, he talks about her in this piece. And it, she looked proud like an American missionary leaving for Africa. both for Armenians and for Arabs. Unlike her approach to Syria, after which Halid Edip had to write responses explaining that she, she wants independence for Syrians. But unlike her approach for, to Syria, for Halid Edip, giving territory to Armenians was inconceivable. She believed that Armenian and Turkish cohabitation could be rehabilitated. The wartime policies of annihilation were just another round of massacres like the ones during the Hamidian regime or in 1909. Why wouldn't Armenians just continue trusting the Turks that it would be all fine? Zari Kayan Kiryan didn't trust the Turks anymore. For her and every Armenian she knew, it was the end. For post-genocide Armenians, feminist and non-feminist alike, cohabitation was not possible anymore, ideally at this stage still, after the gravity of the crime. They were in the face of total destruction. Just to give one seemingly simple example, all the girls' schools that Armenian feminists opened in Anatolia from 1880s on were wiped out during the genocide. Basically, feminists lose their target. Not just humans, but also institutions are gone. Retributive justice demanded that they have a national home of their own where they would be safe and secure. As Ari Shekerian argues in his upcoming book, that something that had never happened since 1453 happened in 1918, namely foreign Western victorious boots on the ground 
enable Armenians uh, to express their complaints, accuse the Turks of mass murder, and ask for compensation in the form of self-determination and territorial sovereignty. It is easy then to guess that Halide and Zaruhi never cooperated. The irreconcilable difference between the feminists lied in their understanding of justice, in our case, restorative justice. They were in fundamental agreement as to what happened to Armenians during the war and how, but they fundamentally disagreed about how to punish the perpetrators and ease the pain of the survivors. I'm very close to my ending. I'll, I'll bring one more example, which is from the New York Times. In 1922, the Times published a short editorial titled Turkish Jean d'Arc, which hailed Halide Hanum as the leader of modern Turkish women, adding that during the war, she spent some two years in and around Damascus. And this galvanized many, including Aravni Yeranyan. Ahavni Yeranyan, a Chorlu-born uh, in, in, near Istanbul, Chorlu-born Armenian woman, a few years Halide's junior, who went to Constantinople College for Girls together with Halide's younger sisters, who then after the war left for the United States, who was living there, who would later write the red flag on Ararat, the book about Soviet Armenia. She wrote an expose, and it was published the next week in New York Times, titled The Turkish Jean d'Arc, an Armenian picture of the remarkable Halide Hedepanam, and published one week after the original piece. The essay accused Halide Edip of making a political career out of Armenian persecution. She wrote, it was in these some, some two years she spent in and around Damascus, that put Halide Edip Hanum on her road to Ankara. She went on. So this little woman who so often boasts of her American ideals of womanhood, which her Western friends make so much of, after calmly planning with her associate various forms of human tortures for Armenian mothers and young women, undertook the task of making Turks of their orphaned children. In short, exactly what Halide Edip feared would happen, happened. Aintura was used as evidence as archive, but it didn't matter, at least not politically. The partitioning of Anatolia was prevented. Halide's side won. Yet she couldn't enjoy the fruits of victory in her home. Parting ways with Mustafa Kemal early on, she left for Europe in 1926 to return home only after Atatürk's passing. In her memoir, she talked about her heroic efforts in Antura, putting the blame of the forced conversions on Jamal Pasha, whom she also represented as being driven solely by humanitarian instinct. Regarding the post-war years, Halide's memoirs accused Armenians, especially Armenian women, of forcibly Armenianizing Turkish orphans. She produced literature of various sorts until the end of her life. And as argued by Hazal Halavut, who specializes on her literary output, she never turned her experiences with Armenians into a topic in her literature. Despite so, whenever she mentioned Armenians, she used an exclusively, exclusively racist terms. She died in Istanbul in 1964. In this story, Zari Kalem Keryan represents the side that was defeated and twice. Like most of her colleagues and friends, she left Istanbul for the United States after the consolidation of the Kemalist movement. She became a prominent member of Armenian communities in New York City and Connecticut, partaking in the efforts to preserve Armenianness in alien hostlands. In 28, she became the first woman to serve on the Armenian General Benevolent Union's Central Board of Directors and was a moving force in its women's groups. She co-founded and chaired the Cosmo Constantinopolitan Armenian Society in New York, joint church groups lectured on multiple topics, including Armenian women writers in Istanbul, and wrote stories, book reviews, and memoirs. And in her memoirs, she included the full text of the open letter that she wrote uh, for Halide Edip. She died in New Jersey in 1971. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lerna. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for that 
beautiful paper. Um, I can say that I am very happy to be the second best person to comment on your paper. So Lerna's work uh, in her earlier writings, in the book that she's produced, uh, is really about recovery, restoration, and I would even put it as resurrection from oblivion and from the ashes of genocide of a history that's been obscured, denied, and basically annihilated. By focusing on women, Lerna is not simply adding to an older story, but reconceiving that story fundamentally. And I think that's what feminist scholarship has done so well. It's brought to historical study a serious, even, even subversive questioning of stable given categories. What neo-Marxists tried to do with class to question what kind of category it was, how constructed it was, what constructivist scholars have had to do with, tried to do with ethnicity and nation, feminist scholars did with the most naturalized and unhistoricized categories of all, namely sex and gender. And this was a fundamental challenge, even a threat to those of us who identify as male. He, his, him are my pronouns. And we're shaken, many of us shaken, in this assault on unquestioned identities. So she brings a perspective and a knowledge and a kind of archeology span of the archival sources, along with Melissa Bilel, uh, to uh, open up a history that's just not been there before. And Lerner sets out in this very uh, ambitious project in the paper by saying, I'm interested in the possibilities and impossibilities of feminist solidarity, especially between ethno-religious communities organized separately by imperial hierarchies and or women divided between perpetrator and victim groups. So here's a big question. Can these communities, even with the efforts of women who have these kind of sympathetic and uh, uh, affective ties with one another, can it be, make some kind of imperial uh, setting in which these peoples can live together? The larger context of the paper is empire, right? Something we often forget. We look back at these histories as separate siloed nation, national histories, but this is, she's very much into it, this kind of imperial setting that many Ottomanists have been playing with and, and expanding in, in, in their understanding in recent years. So in this empire, there are different imaginaries of possible political arrangements that would allow the peoples of the empires, of the empire, Turks, Kurds, Arabs, Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, Jews, and others to somehow coexist. But there were of course, cultural, personal, ideological, and very importantly, structural obstacles that had to be overcome and which had been around for a long time to make this empire uh, and a multinational project somehow work. From Lerner's paper and the slides, one does get a sense of a whole society, a society of these Armenian women, of Turkish women, which, uh, which might have made a difference. But one of them, that Armenian society in all of its complexity and elaboration, let's think about it, Armenians had all kinds of skills, they had enterprises, they had churches, monuments, they had clubs, they played sports, they wrote in newspapers, we see the richness of this, that whole society, that culture was annihilated. And it reminds me of a fantastic film many years ago I watched called Image Before My Eyes, I urge you to look for it. Image Before My Eyes was about the society, the Jewish society of interwar Poland. And without even mentioning the Holocaust, you watch these Jews in their elaborated culture and society and political parties and newspapers who will be eventually 
completely eliminated. So the frame is imperial, and the question is about the possibilities of Ottomanism, of some kind of combination of civic and ethnic uh, identities in some peaceful uh, integration. And one has to ask this hard question, and I, I ask you Ottomanists out there, because I'm, I'm from a foreign land, uh, was Ottomanism ever really possible? Or wasn't it in many ways, it, by even many of its Turkish uh, authors, a kind of Herrenvolk idea? An idea that one people, the Herrenvolk, the dominant people, Muslims perhaps, but very much more particularly in the early 20th century, Turks and their language, Turkish, would be on top. This was an imperial, uh, a national imperial, or an imperial nationalism uh, that was uh, contained within this Ottomanism, which of course put Armenians at a subordinate position, even as much as they might claim these cultural and affective ties with other, uh, other peoples, particularly Armenian women feeling those ties with Turkish and Muslim women. How could you resolve this tension between the empire as ethnic versus civic? And it seems to me what Lern has done in this paper is make it evident, not only in the story or not only in a big structural way, but evident in the biographies of Halid, Halide Edip and the Armenian women that she has brought forth. Now, from the paper, I got the idea, and I wonder, Lerna, if this is what you intended, that you think it was possible that there could have been, under some circumstances, perhaps in an easier international setting, for ethnic and civic to coexist, to have some kind of Ottomanism. I don't know. Perhaps it was, but it wouldn't be easy, right? Lerner brings us examples with her women of the desire for Ottomanism. After all, what alternatives were there in the Hamidian years or even in the second constitutional period? Independence, most political parties, Armenian political parties, and none after really 1908 argued for separation and independence. They were trying to find a way to live within the Ottoman uh, Empire. In my book, uh, They Can Live in the Desert by Nowhere Else, that was one of the things that surprised me, how strong this idea with people like Krikor Zorab and many Armenian intellectuals, most of whom would be murdered during the genocide, how much they felt both Armenian but also Ottoman and hoped for this kind of, of, of combination. Now, in Lerna's telling, I think quite rightly, she shows how Adana ended that possibility. Suddenly a year after the promise, maybe the unfulfilled or even impossible promise of the 1908 revolution, there was a counter revolution defeated ultimately by young Turks, certain young Turks. But as we know from Bedros Der Matosyan's work and others, also in which young Turks at least locally participated. We know also that Armenians, particularly Zabel Yeseyan, went out to uh, Cilicia to see what was happening, the tragic fate. And she wrote articles about this and eventually a book published in 1911, Avarak Neru Mech, Among the Ruins. I wonder if that book might in an article, if this comes out as an article, might be also placed in dialogue with the women that you do mention here uh, and see where, where that all fits in together. Now, Ottomanism has a checkered and difficult history. Already under Abdul Hamid II, in that new uh, amalgam that he created, where he brings the, brought the uh, uh, Tanzimat to an end and tried instead to forge a Turkish-Kurdish pan-Islamic alliance, the example, best example is the Hamidia regiments. It seems to me Ottomanism is already being sorely tested and of course will be threatened uh, eventually. Uh, and then there's the promise of 1908, the celebrations that we all know about of Greeks and Armenians and others in the streets, happy about what's about to come about, that doesn't come about. 
and I would argue that it's not so much evil intentions of particular actors or secret, you know, Turkic nationalist uh, ideas, but of deeply uh, deep structural contradictions in the very idea of this empire and of Ottomanism that ultimately would make this fail. Adana is very important and it's different from the Hamidian massacres because with the Hamidian massacres, as much as, as much as there was social and popular participation in the killing, there was very strong state initiation and sanctioning, legitimation of violence. Adana was a sign of something much, much more difficult to deal with. Adana was a social bottom-up event. It was a pogrom, it was a popular riot. As Dermatosian again shows in his own work, the, the opening of the public sphere, the possibility of Armenians to express themselves on the street, ring their bells, even carry arms. All of this was seen as a kind of threat to many Muslims and they tried to take their revenge. And after Adana, an event that affected my own family, my grandfather, my mother's father, Avadis Kezekian, a uh, 19-year-old tailor, thought after Adana, there's no future in this country. And he took a boat and went to America and never saw his family again. All of them in the central Turkish city of Yozgat were murdered. After Adana, and in that period, as we move toward the First World War, and the Balkan Wars, revenge became more and more a major theme in Turkish discourse as Turkic nationalism became more influential in the Young Turk, uh, the Young Turk discourses. And eventually the most radical Young Turks in January 1913 take over the empire. So Ottomanism is frail, fragile, and something that the, the noble efforts of these women to make it work seems to me quite uh, futile almost from the beginning. I hope not, I wish not, but I worry that it might be. Armenians and Muslims then come away from the greater tragedy of 1915 with different understandings of who was to blame for the, gen the genocide. As Lerna puts it, the Armenians general understanding was that the whole of the Turkish nation was the culprit, culprit and had to be punished accordingly. And that could be openly expressed, at least for a time, during the armistice period, 1918 to roughly 1922-23. But Halide and Turkish, the Turkish side, on the other hand, uh, thought that the Turkish nation was in fact innocent. A few people, the Germans perhaps, were the real, real uh, culprits. And she denies uh, the, that uh, the, the, the Turks were uh, at least in large numbers or uh, the nation as a whole was, was guilty. Uh, she says that uh, we shouldn't put the blame on the quote, innocent shoulders of the Turkish nation. So as Lerner shows so beautifully, Halide uh, uh, is in Halid, Halid, uh, uh, Edip is in fact a defender and a spokesman for her people, her nation as she conceived it, which is by this time a nation of perpetrators. And she frankly denies this harsh fact. She becomes one of the authors of the denialist thesis that I would say begins already with Abdul Hamid II and continues to Recep Tayyip Erdogan in the present time. One of the things uh, I would ask um, uh, Lerna is to emphasize more as you work on this paper, to emphasize context and the shifting context. Now you're doing a kind of, you know, cross time analysis by taking pieces from different episodes, but I as a kind of more conventional historian would emphasize context. Um, there's a really interesting debate between Zarawi Kalimkerian's open letter and Edip's essay in the face of Wilsonian principles, because they are located so intimately in the armistice period. And as Adi Shekerian's work demonstrates, 
there are important moments there in the armistice moment uh, when Armenians can express them in a certain way. Turks have to be more defensive. That's going to change when the armistice ends. And there are changes in, in discourse before, during, and after this period. Uh, Armenians are desperately looking for allies. They have them on the ground, boots on the ground, as you said, uh, for, for, for that brief period, but then they will lose that. My sense, and I agree with you completely, that Halideh is one of those intellectuals that was close to the Turkish government, uh, um, who was against the wholesale massacring of the Armenians. And you mentioned that she was aligned here more with Jemal Pasha, who preferred conversion to an annihilation. Um, I would urge you to look at a paper that I commented on uh, at UCLA that Tanur Akcham gave, where he shows pretty convincingly, despite what Hilmar Kaiser and others are saying, that Jemal agreed wholeheartedly with Talat. They were always very close. Uh, and though he was in a different geographic situation uh, in, in the Middle East, in, in, in Arab, Arab uh, Middle, Middle East, uh, he, he was really one with, with the genocidal intention of the regime. But that's a question and that's still an open question. What's really interesting in this paper is that um, there, were, there was an ideal, a kind of utopia that women try to organize in some way on the basis of Ottomanism. But that ideal was periodically and repeatedly undermined by events and by the division between perpetrator and victim. I should mention that from my own research on the genocide, women did not just keep silent during the genocide. There are many instances in which women actively participated in the genocide in various ways, even engaging in murder. So I heartily agree with Lerner's conclusions and her approach and the insights that feminism gives here. It's clear that Ottomanism, as ideal as it might have been had it ever worked, was long gone, dead, chipped away at, undermined repeatedly. And that by the end of the armistice period, with the rise of the Kemalist movement, Turkey and the Turks were well on their way to an ethnocultural, assimilationist, nationally exclusive nation state, the Kemalist Republic, in which there would be no place really for Greeks or Armenians, or as it's turned out at the moment, neither for Kurds uh, insofar it is now becoming increasingly so nationalist and so Turkish. So I open the floor first to Lerna, if she would like to comment, and then I'll look for some questions in the Q&A. Lerna. Thank you, Ron, for the comment. Uh, uh, I am planning on turning this into an article of some sort, um, motivated enough to work on this topic more. I mean, we are already covering some parts of this story in the book with Melissa, but it will likely be a standalone piece that will revolve more around Halideh de Badawar and her Armenian, Armenian lives of Halideh de Badawar, really. And during which I will obviously include more context, one of them being the Balkan Wars. Like, as you mentioned, that is when the real radicalization starts. I had to pull just a few instances of this encounter, but there is stuff that was going on in the Balkan Wars also. This is, yeah, but even after the Balkan Wars, I have to say, she is able to differentiate uh, the Serbians, the Greek, the previous uh, uh, subject groups who became states and are now attacking against their previous uh, lords, let's say, uh, from Armenians. Like he, she's, she's complicated and sophisticated enough not to merge them all under the category of like Christians against us. Um, so what I find interesting is that, so Jamal Pasha's policies, yes, there is, there is, Tanerakcham wrote, I'm, I'm familiar with people who also 
focus. I mean, are, are convinced, I mean, both sides at this point, I think that they're convincingly <laughs> arguing that it is, he was both some kind of a rescuer and the genocidaire, which is the title of Umit Kurt's recent article specifically about Jamal Pasha, right, that I recently read. It's, it's a topic that I find that I need to go in a bit deeper. However, about Halit Edip, I can say that we have enough evidence that she was against annihilation at this point. So there is one letter, for instance, that is that she wrote to Javid Bey, uh, finance minister, in 1917, which ended up being in Talat Pasha's archives, which Murat Bardakçı, a few about a decade ago now, published. The, uh, the letter is in there. And in the letter, Halide Edip is talking about uh, the, the horrific images, I mean, not images, uh, scenes that are unfolding in front of her as Armenian women are uh, lamenting their losses, like the survivors, the refugees there, and, and, and middle-aged men that look so strong, weeping because he saw his son uh, being killed in front of his eyes. And he's, she's talking about them explicitly as Armenians. And at the end of the letter, she says, can the current government do something to, e if we cannot totally undo this, can the current government uh, at least give human rights to the survivors? So she's trying to eat. However, she's also engaged in at the same time, which is which is the interesting, this enigmatic part of her that one of the reasons why I'm, I'm attracted to her as a object of study at this point is she doesn't see it in any kind of conflicting way at the time at least to turn these children i mean at the same time that she she's saying those things she is really forcibly islamicizing mm. and turkifying these children is it out of humanitarianism does it count for us at this moment like the interesting is that we know that it's one of the defining one of the articles of the genocide convention recognizes children's transfer as a defining feature of genocide which we can say is a more like new thing post 1948 so it would be anachronistic to think of it at the time like that but that's why i brought up that document because she knows that even for that time it is not it's against now first of all i mean it's against islam right there's no force in conversion in Islam, but she's, the source is not there for her. It, uh, the, where is the source? Like, why does she, why does she think that they, because, I mean, why does she think that it will be used against them? Because it happened before, we didn't talk about that part either, but Hamidian massacres, forcible conversion, Adana massacres, kidnapping, mass kidnapping of girls and women and uh, conversion, and she's, she's well-versed in English, right? She reads the global press. She has connections. All American colony in Istanbul is her friend. Like she's the liaison between the Americans in town and the Ottoman Turkish uh, elite, political and intellectual elite. So she's, she's, she knows how they will be looking at them post factum. And she's, instead of not being engaged in it, she's trying to cover the evidence and then she keeps doing damage control. Yeah. So th this is really interesting and it leads to our questions. So in, in uh, Turkish nationalism and in even Turkish identity in the Republican period, there's always a combination of, of ethnicity, even race and ideas of Islam. And it'd be interesting to think about what her, Halid, uh, the um, attitude toward Islam was. She's a very educated and westernized woman, it seems in many ways. So let me read this question and see if this doesn't give you a hook to try to answer some of those things. Uh, our our uh, uh, questionnaire asks, having read the book, Goodbye Antura, I felt a certain sense of condescension toward the children belonging to Armenians on the part of Halideh when she was overseeing the orphanage there, not so much wanting to hurt them, but more a feeling of knowing that those children needed to be changed to belong to the emerging Turkish nation. What do you think? Uh, 
what do I think about if about Halide's sincere relations or Panyan's representation of Halide? Overall, at this stage in my thinking, and I am sure it will develop in the coming months and years, possibly that I work on this. But Halide didn't use violence, for instance, against these children. None of the memoirs mentioned that, right? So in that sense, she's not this uh, blood crazy uh, disciplinarian who will suck the Turkish, like suck the Armenian blood out of them. She's not that monstrous character, but she turns a blind, blind eye for sure. And I mean, Panyan Memoirs talks, talks about her as being a bit distant, aloof, seeing it, Panyan uh, questions if she, she saying if uh, if she is if she's thinking about her own children, for instance, as she sees this violent, torturous treatment of children who are already orphaned, um, she could have been a bypasser, like categorically, we could have put her in there, but she is the superintendent, she is the supervisor. She's not the supervisor of Aintur, she's the superintendent of the whole system over there. So this is when responsibility comes into place uh, she had a lot of influence over Jamal Pasha. This is now known. Could she change Jamal Pasha's approach towards this particular orphanage? In the memoirs that she wrote, she says that she tried to warn him that uh, this wasn't the like, right thing to do, right path to pursue, but that Jamal told her that uh, the, otherwise, the government, Istanbul, will not allow them to keep these orphans alive. So they had to they had to do this. This is, for instance, an exaggeration, most likely, because they could have turned their names into Turkish, right? Like they could have, they, the Ottoman government does this. So bureaucratically, they could have managed it and they could have let some kind of leniency inside the school. The kids are really, I mean, multiple memoirs. We have enough evidence to say that the kids were uh, forbidden to speak Armenian, and they would be uh, really punished if they were to speak Armenian or use their crosses. Like this is a real effort to to metam for metamorphosis. Right? Yeah, erasure. So, yeah, and and and she's in, therefore given her responsibility and role there, and that she wasn't forced to be there, which I think is a very important thing for me to locate her. Even if her intentions are not totally evil, why did she stay there? Right? And this is what Ahmed Hashim, I mean, people question this. They also, uh, Zaryu Kalim Keryan is not the only one writing about her post war in Istanbul. Army, other, Shavash Misakyan, for instance, a Tashnak intellectual who was in prison at the time, who would later leave and become the main editor of Haraj newspaper in Paris, our host imaginary host state now. Um, Shavarsh wrote an open letter to Halide. Also a questioning over there, then, then, then why did you stay? Such a rich topic. This is going to be fantastic. You might have to do a whole book on this. I'm not sure. Well, I have to say, I'm thinking of potentially writing a grand biography of Halide. The yeah. yeah. So um, here's a really interesting uh, question from Inje Oranla. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ekmet Tiola, for this wonderful presentation. I have a rather speculative question. You've shown us the difference in tone of Halide Edip's published articles, 1909, uh, Ölenler ver Ölenler. Uh, it only works in Turkish, that phrase. And in 1918, in the face of Wilson's principles, which suggests to me, quote, a failure of morality, unquote, on her part. Would you read this moral failure as increasing after 1915, as grounded in her perpetrator status in Ottomanism, in Turkish guilt, or fear of punishment? How should we understand this moral failure? Hmm. This is a good question. Fear of punishment, I made a gesture towards this in the 
but I don't think it's the main main uh, reason. It might be. I mean, that needs to be digged more. I, I cannot say if, but but more than that, it's really she thinks that the, her nation will be punished, not herself as such, but that the whole group will have to pay for their sins. And uh, I mean, even though there was no convention of genocide, still annihilating a people was not accepted. And we, they knew that as early as mid-1915, the, uh, the Allied powers at least warned them that they would be held personally accountable, right? For the crimes against humanity that, that they commit. So I do think that this whole moral failure rests in the incapability and unwillingness to pay for, uh, collectively pay for the for the events, Don't th not thinking them of as crimes. Like even when she writes about the fact that it was just a few heads who conceived this plan and then implemented it. She talks about them as barbarians. She talks about them as savages, but she also talks about them as idealists, as people who loved their country. So I have a question. I'm gonna to have to make this the last question, but, but we can go on a little bit more if we like. Uh, this is from Ohanas uh, Kilic Dal, uh, our colleague. Thank you, Lerna, for this really elucidating talk inspired by Ron's comments. I'd like to ask you, what is the original, uh, if any, contribution of feminism and feminists from different communities to Ottomanism and Ottomanist discourse? Or was it just a reproduction of male-produced discourse of Ottomanism? Did these feminists from different communities achieve uh, open, uh, an open alternative or more or less autonomous channel of Ottomanism. And then he has a second trivial question. He says, I noticed Kalim Karyan's husband wears a uniform in the photo you showed. Do you know his occupation, why he's wearing a uniform? Yes, good catch. Gümüş Suyu uh, Hospital, Askeri Hospital, military hospital. He was a form pharmacist in that hospital and he was a colonel. Uh, I should have mentioned that actually, the, the uniform. Um, the other question, the Ottomans, which does connect to what Ron was uh, saying in his comments, which is a question that Melissa and I, I have been contemplating in the context of our attempt to, uh, to reach to a periodization of Armenian feminism and in our attempts to find the right kind of response to the question of uh, Armenian Turkish feminist collaboration. Did it happen? Did it not happen? Why did it not happen? Did it reflect always? Did it mirror what happened amongst men? Type of a question. Um, I, I am a structuralist when it comes to these things. I, I think Ron, you are also <laughs> going towards that. I mean, at least the way you present it. Okay, let me put it this way. I don't think Ottomanism was inevitably impossible, but it re would have required significant imagination, sacrifice, creativity, and the right international context, political context. Right international context was missing at that time. If it had happened earlier, way earlier, its chances of working would have been higher. It's, it comes too late to the picture of, as some many people are argued. But there is still hope because you cannot, at the time, actors do, cannot zoom out so much and they don't know what will happen. I mean, there is some teleological thinking to what the way I'm, I'm talking about this right now, I recognize. So how did it, I mean, yes, Young Turk Revolution, I do think that after the Constitutional Revolution, the feminists we study, as well as, as, well as Halide Edep, Shukufe Nihal, other Turkish feminists too, sincerely and wholeheartedly believed that a way of uh, horizontally organizing society 
would be desirable? Were they, would they be willing to give up the historically ingrained status of being the dominant nation, being the hierarchically uh, superior nation, what would be called here the white privilege? Would they be willing to give up their white privilege really? Most of them didn't. What we know is that they didn't because if they have, I mean, Adana also comes so fast. This is also, I think, just like coincidence, conjuncture, all these things also matter because it's just like in five, six months. It's Ohannes, who's someone who wrote about the Adana post, I mean, post constitutional revolution and post Adana uh, Armenian intellectuals in Anatolia himself knows all too well. It just happens all too fast for us to come to a clear vision about this. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, I think you put it very nicely about the, the structural part, um, the, the, the Herrenvolk or the dominant group privilege, not just different religions, but that, that hierarchical thing there. The, one of the key instances for me always was the attempt to solve the land problem, the, the ambition at first after 1908 to return Armenian lands that Kurds had taken, and then the impossibility to do that, or ultimately the giving up and refusal to do that. I guess I have one more question. It's only fair to let Adi Shakerian ask the question because this is so much in his, as we say in English, wheelhouse. I don't like that phrase, but in his area. He says, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Lerna, I want to ask if Halide Edip wrote articles about the Armenian genocide or Armenians in general after her October 1918 article published in the Ottoman dailies. I'm curious to know what topics she wrote from October 1918 until the uh, Sultan Ahmed demonstration in May 1919 and the emergence of Turkish national movement. That has to be, I guess, our last question. But sure. take all the time you want. OK, no, I, I shouldn't take more than five minutes. If I do, please stop me. Everyone is tired. Everyone wants to go home. Some Parisian people will go home and drink wine because it's late for them. We have to wait a little bit longer here. Um, she doesn't write much. So right after the Wilson piece, October 22, um, some Arabs question her to explicitly uh, ask her what, what, what was she doing in, the, in Damascus, really? And she says, she responds to them. She has at least one article of Suriye'de uh, Türkler in which she talks about Aintura in a couple of paragraphs and making, a diff making it a bit a different story than what happened to Arabs. Um, in terms of um, but she, Halide is not doesn't write too much until the Sultan Ahmed uh, meeting the protest. Okay, this is this is I guess the main point. But she gets she organizes, for instance, a, a milli congre or milli majlis. I forgot a group of national. I mean, a group of concerned intellectuals who are becoming more nationalist. More, uh, she uh, becomes actually a moving force behind this um, mobilization for possible resistance to the Allied occupation. But she's not active in the press at the time. This is incredibly interesting. And I hope you do write this up. I would love to see it as in that larger context that you've presented it, which is the dialogue between uh, Armenian, maybe other, and, and Turkish women around uh, Hal uh, Halide Edip. This would be fantastic. And you you're the right person to do it. Lerna, we can't hug you. We can't even really clap loudly, mm -hmm. uh, but we can at least show how much we appreciate what you've done and what you are doing. You're expanding uh, Ottoman history, late Ottoman history, Armenian history. You and uh, Melissa Bilal in this incredible work, which I know because I actually read it, read your proposal and <laughs> wrote positively for it. So uh, I applaud what you've done and thank you so much for all of this great stuff, for bringing new perspectives and new information and moving our knowledge further and further uh, into, into the light. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank, thank you, Lerna. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, and thank you for the wonderful lecture, the excellent extemporaneous impromptu uh, discussion, and a, a really insightful Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Now I have to go teach my class. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> No, it was really, really good, Lerna. Thank you so much. Thank so you, Ron. Perfect. Really, yeah, it was. It was good. I hope we can be in the same room sometime together. <laughs> yes, let's let's do this conference eventually. We will do it. Now keep keep this string going because this yeah, I, I definitely. You know, the, the the the last two sessions have been really excellent, and I, I think that we should. I think that we should keep this conversation going until this pandemic is finished. Good. <laughs> All right, Thank guys. you all. Good yeah. night. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye bye. bye.